and welcome again to Excited About the Gospel. My name is Jason Harwood. I'm your lifelong seminary teacher. Happy to be with you on this scripture study journey as we work together to study the gospel, find application, and be a little bit excited about it. Uh, find ways to be excited about the gospel of God's love for us. Uh, in this week's uh, study. Oh my gosh, we got so much good stuff. Like, buckle up because this is exciting. <laughs> we are in 3 Nephi chapter 17 primarily in Come Follow Me this week. I mean, there's a lot of chapters, but that's where we're going to focus our study is 3 Nephi chapter 17 and look particularly at this concept of ministering. Oh boy, we got Bible stories, we got quotes from modern leaders, we have scriptures and powerful principles of how we apply this to our life. I am so excited to study this together with you. 3 Nephi chapter 17, I love this chapter because it's kind of um, Jesus's free time. That's always a good indication of our own lives is what you do in your free time. You know, we all have obligations and things that we're pretty locked into as far as our time goes. And then it's, okay, you got some downtime. What do you do with, with that time? Third Nephi chapter 17 is Jesus's downtime because he says at the beginning that he needs to go. Therefore, go ye, this is 17.3, go into your homes, ponder upon the things which I have said, ask of the Father in my name that you may understand and prepare your minds for tomorrow and I come unto you again. But now I go unto the Father and also to show myself unto the lost tribes of Israel for they're not lost unto the Father for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. So he's like, okay, I'm done for the day. 16, 35, 16 is really day one and, and at the beginning of 17, he says, okay, I'm done. I gotta go. You guys go back, you know, share, pray, ponder, try to understand. I'll come back tomorrow. Came to pass that when Jesus had thus spoken, he cast his eyes round about again on the multitude. They were in tears and did look steadfastly upon him as if they would ask him to tarry a little longer with them. He said unto, him, unto them, behold, my bowels are filled with compassion toward you. So he decides to stay for a little bit longer. And again, this is not part of the assignment. This is not necessarily what he was supposed to do. This is just now, okay, you know what? I, I want to stick around a little bit. And what does he do? First question, have ye any that are sick among you? Bring them hither. Any that are lame or blind or halt or maimed or leprous or that are withered or that are deaf or that are afflicted in any manner, bring them hither. I will heal them for I have compassion upon you. My bowels are filled with mercy. And he goes through the multitude they bring in verse nine, everybody that needs any healing. They did all both they who had been healed and they who were whole bow down at his feet, did worship him. Then they bring forth the little children. They set him, set all the kids by Jesus. Then Jesus kneels down and prays with them. Father, I'm troubled because of the wickedness of this, the uh, people of the house of Israel. And he's praying with the children. And then this happens. No tongue can speak, neither can there be written by man, neither can the hearts of men conceive so great and marvelous things as we both saw and heard as he's praying. And then he again continues to pray. He weeps in verse 21. And you have this experience uh, with, with Jesus and the children and the angels, and you, you can't write down the things that happen. You can't even comprehend the things which he's saying. And then they cast their eyes to heaven in verse 24, the heavens opened. They saw angels descending out of heaven as it were in the midst of fire. They came down and encircled those little ones. They were encircled about with fire and the angels did minister unto them. And uh, then that's when Jesus kind of wraps up this part of his experience. And then uh, we go into chapter 18 where he institutes the sacrament. But I, I, this is important to me because, and then uh, I, I should wrap up at the end of uh, 18, he ascends into heaven. And that's when his day ends. Uh, free time also included the sacrament. We're not going to look as much at, at that, but it, important to read that and, and study through that chapter. But 17, my gosh. 
He's got some free time. He's got some downtime. He's like, okay, I got, I got a little bit. You know, I know I need to go visit some of the... <laughs> I know I'm supposed to be home, but dad will understand. Father will understand. It's okay if I'm a few minutes late. I'll just tell him, hey, I was doing a bunch of uh, healing and ministering to the children. That's what he does when he's just got some downtime. And so I started thinking about this concept of ministering and these principles about how we treat each other. I just want to share with you a a whole exciting collection of scriptures about this principle, about this idea of ministering, of finding the sick, the afflicted, those who need help and helping them. That concept of Jesus saying, "Uh, my bowels, bowels are filled with compassion towards you. Let me help you. Let me heal you. John taught this in 1 John 3, 16 through 18. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I think when you read chapter 17, you see in action God's love. If if we were to read through the Savior's entire visit to the Nephites. It starts in 11, goes through 26. If we were to say, okay, show me how the Nephites know Jesus loves them. Don't you think you might go to 17? I think my first thought would be 17. I think my first thought would be the healing that he did. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life. It's what God does that shows his love. Then 17, this is still 1 John 3. Whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That is so interesting. John says, let us not Love in word, but let us love in deed. And my word, there is some power behind that concept. And what is it? Whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion. What a great question. How dwelleth the love of God in him? How can we say we have the love of God in us if we don't? Show love, care, and compassion for those around us, those in need. How do we say that? Now, this is interesting because um, in John chapter 5, John records one of these instances of having seen the Savior do this. This is the man at the pool of Bethesda. At the pool of Bethesda, there's a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water, water for an angel came down at certain season into the pool, troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. A certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, to put me in the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And Jesus, of course, gets into a little bit of disagreement with some of the religious leaders of the time because he healed the man on the Sabbath and because the man carried his bed on the Sabbath. Um, Interesting thought there. I remember as a missionary being taught this experience as this concept of of, um, self-reliance and of ministering, of Jesus going and finding this man and saying, let me help you. 
we used it as a, a principle of self-reliance in that the man was doing all he could the man was making every effort he possibly could make and his faith and his belief and his uh, trust in the Savior was there. He just didn't know that the Savior really was the source. Jesus says to him in 6, wilt thou be made whole? And he says, I, I don't have anybody to help me into the pool. And then you see he's looking for outwardly, worldly sources of healing and help when it's the Savior that is the source of healing and help. And it was the 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 Jesus coming into his life that made the difference. Now, for all of us, then we look at ministering and we go, okay, how do I do that? How do I bring Jesus into the life of those around me? And and I sometimes I find myself even praying for that. Sometimes I, I pray and I say, Heavenly Father, help me show those around me who the Savior is. Help me show those around me love and compassion and care in such a way that because of something I do, they'll know you better and they'll know Jesus better. And that's what ministering is all about. Ministering is finding that person by the pool of Bethesda who's been there for a long time and trying his best and doing the best he can and say, how do I, through my actions, help that person come closer to Jesus, the source of help and healing? I love Every time as I start thinking about, okay, what, where have I learned in the Bible this concept? What's the Bible story? We all love a good Bible story. Oh, what, but what's the concept? Where's the Bible story that teaches this concept of the, the sacrifice necessary for ministering, the giving? And boy, one of the first places my mind went was Ruth. Ruth has this terrible, tragic story. Um, where you've got her mother-in-law, Naomi, and, and her and her family come, Naomi and her husband and two sons, and, and they come to Moab, and, and the two sons marry Orpah and Ruth, and then Naomi, her husband dies, and the two brothers die. And so you've got these three women who are in the culture of the day are really left for destitute, Naomi says, I'm going to go back to the, the place where I come from, Bethlehem, but you know, I don't have anything there for you. So Naomi says to Ruth and Orpah to go back with their family. Turn again, my daughters. This is Ruth 112. Go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And then they, they cry and it says, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, meaning she's going to leave. Naomi's telling them, girls, you got to go. I don't have anything for you. I cannot help you. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people, unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. That's Naomi to Ruth. Listen, it's very nice of you, Ruth. Thank you. I don't need any help. You can go now. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Those are some of my favorite all-time verses about ministering. That line, steadfastly. How many options did she have to leave? Naomi kept telling her, I'm fine, go, I'm fine, go, I'm fine. You know, I don't have anything for you. You got to go. And Ruth wouldn't do it. She was steadfastly minded to serve and to be a, a positive influence. My gosh, another one that I think of quite often. Look at this one, Mosiah chapter 18. Oh, this is so good. Mosiah chapter 18 is interesting. This is Alma, the elder. He's teaching at the waters of Mormon. 
the, he's been converted by Abinadi. Now he's out teaching and he's teaching about Jesus at the waters of Mormon. And he says unto them, behold, here are the waters of Mormon. He's about to do this baptism scene. If you've seen the picture of him in the water, he's about to baptize a whole bunch of people. And he says, as you're desirous to come into the fold of God and to be called his people, that's what we want. Oh, I want to be in the fold. I want to be a child of God. I want to be with God and with his people. How? You want to be called in the fold of God to be called his people and are willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be light. The first indication that Alma gives of their willingness to be called God's people, to be in his fold, to, to stand at the right hand of God. He's going to say at the end of verse nine here that you may be numbered with those of the first resurrection and have eternal life. The first part of that covenant is ministering to bear one another's burdens that they may be light. Nine, willing to mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort. I mean, then we get to stand as a witness of God in all times and in all things and in all places that you may be even until death. Where we start is how we treat others. That's where we start. The beginning of it is how we treat others. That took me to Luke chapter three. Luke, Look how cool this is. I, I was literally about to say, Luke chapter 3, look how cool this is. And then all of a sudden I was like, I just said, Luke, look how cool this is. Look how exciting this is in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Now, this is John the Baptist teaching. And he tells them, do not say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. See, the people of the time were a bit concerned. Well, they, they felt very confident in themselves because of their heritage, because of their ancestry. They were God's chosen people. They, they had covenant all the way back to Abraham that, that God was going to bless and, and save them and protect them. And they were God's chosen people. And he's saying, no. God can raise up of these stones, children unto Abraham, and then he gives them a bit of a warning. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. It's not your heritage. It's not your ancestry. It's not um, those things that are going to save you. And in fact, destruction is coming. The people must have been touched by the spirit because they ask him, what shall we do then? This is John the Baptist. And, and you're thinking, he's going to say, uh, just like we see later in, in Acts chapter 2, a similar question is asked later in ask, Acts chapter 2. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter answers and says, repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, remember sins, you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's not what John the Baptist says. Weird, strange. It's kind of funny. It's kind of strange. He answered and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Isn't that strange? John the Baptist is saying, listen, you're not going to be saved because of your heritage. There's destruction coming. And they say, well, what do we need to do? And he says, well, if you've got two coats, give one of them away. And if you've got some food, share it. And the publicans, they come to be baptized and say, master, what shall we do? And he saith unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed unto you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he saith unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any fight falsely. Be content with your wages. Every single instance, it was, How do you treat others? He, he wasn't even getting to baptism yet. He, he was... And, and it even says they come to him to be baptized and he, and, and they say, what shall we do? And he says, um, yeah, just treat others. Good. Fascinating insights into what mattered to John the Baptist. 
I love this one. This is great. Deuteronomy. This goes all the way back. This isn't new stuff. This isn't like um, new gospel stuff. Look, look at Deuteronomy. This is old time stuff. Now, in the, the um, Old Testament, there was this interesting thing. Every seven years... Every seven years, they had a jubilee year, and every seventh year, debts were forgiven. There was all this great stuff that happened, but if somebody owed you things um, uh, every seventh year, all those debts were forgiven. And kind of an interesting idea. Listen to how uh, uh, the prophet, speaking the words of God, talks to the people. It's like, it's like God knows human nature. He says, beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand. So it's like, you know, it's been six and a half years since we've had a Jubilee year and debts are forgiven. And, and now we're only a few months away from another one. And he says, don't say in your wicked heart, the seventh year is coming and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother and thou givest him not. And he cry unto the Lord against thee and it be sin unto thee. How crazy is that? A guy comes to you. The guy knows it's been six, six years and, and, and six months. The guy knows that we're just a couple of months away from Jubilee year. And he comes and he asks for stuff. And maybe in his mind, he knows I'm going to ask for stuff now. Because if you give me stuff in a couple of months, I don't got to give it back. Because it's Jubilee year and it's all going to be forgiven. And Jesus, you know, God is saying to the children of Israel, don't say, I'm not going to give him anything in a couple of months. I'm going to have to forgive him. And he's just coming to me because, um, you know, uh, for bad reasons, bad intent. I, sometimes I see this in our own society now of people saying, I'm not going to give. What are they going to do with that money? I'm not going to give. They're going to go spend that on alcohol or booze. I'm not going to give. They, they, you know, they should take better care of themselves or why don't they do this? Or I'm not going to give. Why don't they? Do, what if I get ripped off? What if I give the money and I get ripped off? Jesus is literally telling the people then, don't say that in your wicked heart. Because if you do and you don't give, it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. Because that for this thing, the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore, I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Open your hand wide. It doesn't matter. If you give it to him, and a couple of months later, you have to forgive it of him. And, and he kind of got away with it. Who? It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works. Thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. You see, we minister not because of what it will do for the other person. That's important. I mean, obviously, the other people have need. We minister because of what we need. My heart needs to minister. Because my heart has some issues. And, and I need the ministering. I need, not to be ministered to, but I need the gift of ministering and the impact that that will have on my heart. I need that in my life. And, and, and I think it's impossible for us to talk about this principle without at least touching very briefly here on Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, inasmuch as you've done on the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. I've in previous podcast episodes, I've, I've gone deep into this, but the, the sheep and the goats, he's separating the sheep and the goats and the sheep are on the right hand and they're going to go into the kingdom of heaven. How did they get on the right hand? They even ask him, you know, how, how did we get here? I was in hunger. You gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto thee. And they're going to say, when saw we thee unhungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? And as much as you have done it unto the least of my, these brethren, you've done it unto me. It's how we treat other people. 
Two quotes from modern leaders. Marvin J. Ashton, member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, in a conference talk in April in the Wayback Machine. We went all the way back to 1992. It's sad because for somebody like me, 1992 doesn't seem that long ago, but it turns out it was a long time ago. Uh, but uh, 1992, the tongue can be a sharp sword. He, see, he says, here's Elder Ashton. It seems interesting that the first principles the Lord Jesus Christ chose to teach his newly called apostles were those that center around the way we treat each other. And then what did he emphasize during the brief period he spent with the Nephites on this continent? Basically the same message. Could this be because the way we treat each other is the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whew. That's a question for you to ponder today. Could this be because the way we treat each other is the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would you consider this idea for a moment? That the way we treat the members of our families, our friends, and those with whom we work each day is as important as are some of the more noticeable gospel principles we sometimes emphasize. Think about that one. What are, what are some of the more noticeable gospel principles that we sometimes emphasize? You know, prayer, scriptures, going to church, going to the temple, um, word of wisdom, tithing, a bit more noticeable. Is it that the way that we treat others is as important? Elder Ashton then um, ends up his quote, may I emphasize the principle that when we truly become converted to Jesus Christ, committed to him, an interesting thing happens. Our attention turns to the welfare of our fellow men. Now, that's a lot of words and very powerful, very thought-provoking. But luckily in 2023, we have a single sentence from our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, in a talk called Peacemakers Needed, that answers every question Marvin J. Ashton asked there. He's, he's a little softer. Would you consider this idea for a moment? Is it because, um, could this be that the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is how we treat each other? Consider this for a moment. Is, it, is this important? May I emphasize this principle? Now, listen to President Nelson. He just comes right out and in one sentence just declares it. One of the easiest ways to identify a true follower of Jesus Christ is how compassionately that person treats other people. Boom, period, full stop, full send. The kids say these days. That's it. That's it right there. When we think of 3 Nephi chapter 17 and we say, how did Jesus show love? That, that's what John said in 1 John 3. Here's how we know Jesus loved us because he died for us. Let us not love in word, but let us love in deed. How do we show we are a true follower of Jesus Christ? The easiest way to identify a true follower of Jesus Christ is how that person treats other people. <laughs> Why does Jesus emphasize this? He, he, he points that out. Elder Ashton pointed that out. That's what he focused on. Could this be because the way we treat others is the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? We don't have to wonder. President Nelson came right out and said it. The way to identify a true follower of Jesus Christ is how that person treats other people. And, and all of these scriptures that we've shared, John, the pool of Bethesda, Ruth, Alma the Elder, uh, uh, the waters of Mormon, Deuteronomy way back when, John the Baptist preaching, Matthew 25, 1 John 3, all of it leads to that statement. The foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way to identify a true follower. He emphasized that, by the way. He italicized that. When you go read that quote, those two words, true follower of Jesus Christ. Think about that. A true follower of Jesus Christ. The way you identify it is the way you treat others. That's the message for this week. <laughs> How exciting is that? Love it. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ right there. The foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The way to be a true follower of Jesus Christ is just go out and be nice to people. I can do that. I think I can handle that this week. I mean, it's going to be tough. Trust me. I tried to be nice before. It's not easy. But I can do it. And that's pretty exciting. Because I can go out and I can say, you know what, Jesus? I'm going to be a true follower of Jesus Christ this week. I'm going to treat others nice. I'm going to be tested. I'm going to be tried probably by my family. 
first and foremost, but I'm gonna give it a go. Uh, give my best effort to just be nice. That's the foundation. That's the identity of a true follower of Jesus Christ is how compassionately we treat others. And I can do that this week. I hope you're excited to go do it with me. Thank you so much for participating in the Excited About the Gospel podcast. I can't wait to talk with you on the next one.